Jackie didn't send me a bio, or Ryan didn't send me the bio. Somebody didn't send me the bio, so we're gonna wing it really quick. Um, I know that Wally has been in the field for a very, very long time. Um, something about like 20 years or something 40, like that. 60 something, yeah. It feels like often. <laughs> 20 years, doesn't look a day over the 20 year mark. Right. So I've been in the field for 20 years, breeding various geckos. Um, you probably know him best from Supreme Geckos and the amazing work he does and the educational YouTube videos he does. He is one of the most positive personalities I have ever had the privilege of meeting in the reptile community. And I can honestly say, if you are ever going to be at a reptile show and you get to meet Wally, if you go up to him and talk to him, you will absolutely be treated like you're a friend right out of the gate. Because that's how I was treated. He didn't know me from a hole in the wall, and he treated me like he knew me his entire life. And now I know you. And now you know me, he's like, oh, whatever, it's her. So, you know. <laughs> but no, he is absolutely a wonderful person. He's a font of knowledge and he is a genuine soul who is very happy to share all of that experience and wisdom in a way that most people wouldn't, including talking today about the mistakes he's made. So with no further ado, I'd like to present to you Wally Kern. So based off of that, we know one thing that I've been in the hobby a long time. What that gives me is a lot of experience, a lot of good experience, a lot of bad experience. So if anybody's made a mistake in keeping animals, keeping bugs, keeping anything at all, dealing with reptiles, I've made the mistakes. So um, like Erica said, I'm very, very happy to share these stories. And hopefully, you know, you can listen to these stories and take something home and, and say, well, I don't want to be like Wally and make those same mistakes. <laughs> so the title is Gecko Keeping Mistakes I've Made and How I Overcame Them. Certainly can apply to, to any type of reptile keeping at all. Or how not to be Wally <laughs> And believe me, I, even sitting here for the last 10 minutes, I, I started this presentation uh, late today uh, because I was doing some other things and I came up with a list just like that. Sitting here for the presentation, um, I had two or three other stories. So I'll try to keep this. And, and somebody told me when it gets late and say, well, stop talking, you've got to go home. <laughs> so I'll just briefly mention off of Erica's uh, introduction. Thank you very much. I've been in the hobby about 10 years, uh, Supreme Gecko, we have a website and all the social media stuff. Um, I share a lot of information. I share a lot of information on uh, Facebook and YouTube. I'm always available. If you have a question about geckos, hit me up on Facebook. I'm always around to answer them. Um, I've read probably about 75 geckos, maybe more. I, I can't remember. Um, I've been to over about 250 reptile shows and about 500 exploiters at home. Now, I'm not saying all of this to give you the impression that, that I know everything and I'm not an expert at all. I learn something every single day. The impression hopefully that I, I'm giving you is that I've gone through a lot and I have a lot of experience to share with you. So that was the good news. Let's talk about the bad news. Anybody recognize this animal? Anybody know anything about them? Go ahead. Um and, and this is an interactive discussion. Please, if you have a question, if you have a comment, if you have a I say something wrong, tell me right away. So Impulse buys. Um, I, anybody have an impulse buy at all? Anybody go out and go to a reptile show? Oh my god, I, I have to have this. Oh, I have to have this thing. And do the impulse buy? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. I felt like it earlier today. I felt like it today. So. I feel like it. Yeah? Good for them. Good for them. Good for them. Well, unfortunately, my parents let me buy just whatever I want. So I've had to buy recently. And one of my very first uh, reptiles I ever kept was this guy. And you are absolutely right. They eat ants. Where am I going to find ants in the middle of winter? And, and this was a, like a December purchase. 
So, exactly. So, nothing around internet. And this is 20 years ago, and I'm trying to buy ants on the internet, and that didn't work out, unfortunately for me, and unfortunately for the animals as well. So, you know, I'm going to share some information here, some, some fails on my part, and hopefully, you know, I've learned from this. Maybe I have, maybe I haven't. Um, but the point is that if you can do the research first, if you can hold off, if you go to a show, if you go to a pet store, if you're going through a breeder, if you're going on Facebook, ask the questions, ask the questions, ask the questions. If, if somebody says, well, it's basic care and you should know how to, or you can find that on Google, stop that process immediately and make sure that they tell you about the animals. So do your research first. Anybody, and this is a fish, it's not a reptile, it's certainly not a gecko. Anybody know what this is? It's a cichlid. Anybody know what type of cichlid? Is it a Jack Dempsey? It is a Jack Dempsey. Anybody know what about Jack Dempsey? Why they're called Jack Dempseys? They're aggressive. They're aggressive. They're boxers. They, they, yes, they're boxers. So, uh, I'm a story person, so I'm going to tell a real quick story. Um, I used to be in the Aquarium Society, Milwaukee Aquarium Society. Um, used to do a lot of things there. Uh, we used to go to auctions. And one of the very first auctions that I ever went to, bag after bag of fish in, and I knew some of the fish. Um, I certainly knew what this was. And a bag of Jack Dempsey, or a Jack Dempsey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're not going to find a pair of Jack Dempsey's that are that aggressive. Um, so a Jack Dempsey came up, and probably a male. And I was sitting next to my friend, and my wife was in the back with my friend's wife, all good good uh, people and, and good relationships. And he said, oh, you should buy the Jack Dempsey. And I said, oh, no, I shouldn't. You should buy it. Ah, ah. Um, so the bidding started, $1, $2. So somebody bought this Jack Dempsey for $10. And my friend and I, Sergio, we laughed and laughed. Well, two minutes later, my wife walks up the aisle. She had purchased the Jack Dempsey. <laughs> and she had, she had heard me talking something about Jack Dempsey's. Um, my friend obviously laughed at me and, and uh, he said, so what are you, are you going to try to breed it? I, into fish and breeding, are you going to try to breed it? And I said, Sergio, there's, there's really nothing you can put in a tank with a Jack Dempsey. There's really nothing. <coughs> he looked at me and I said, well, maybe a rock. And then, <laughs> then you really have to watch the rock. <laughs> so again, do your research. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Thanks for the purchase. <laughs> um, Wild thing. Um, anybody know what this is? Cat gecko. It's a cat gecko. Mm -hmm. Anybody know anything about cat geckos? They're very rare in the hobby. They're very rare from a captive bred standpoint. So, again, this is probably 15 years ago. I really, really love these cat geckos. They're a slower gecko. They like cooler. I am so sorry to interrupt. That's okay. They're having a hard time hearing you in Fox Valley. Okay. You, you, you need to yell like someone's trying to, you okay. know, I'll, hear I'll over Tinley. Uh, I'll, I'll see if this is better. Tinley so, Joe. There is you the go. mic on? It is on. It's just he's a very low spoken, so the, the bass doesn't pick up as well. Okay. I'll, I'll try to speak up a little bit. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Um, so cat geckos are very rare from a uh, captive bred standpoint. Extremely rare, and especially 15 years ago. Some of these wilder animals are making their way into the hobby, and people are actually breeding them, which is a great thing. Get away from bringing them them in from the wild. So 15 years ago, I saw a cat gecko listed. I had one, two, which is a male and two females, and I asked a lot of questions. I certainly asked if they were wild, and he said that they were. Um, so I ordered them, and they weren't very inexpensive at, at the time. They, they still aren't. So I got them in and sure enough, the male was gone and one of the females was very, very bad. Uh -huh. um, because they're wild, they really go through a lot of stress coming in. Um, it's just a very, very difficult thing. It certainly was 15 years ago, trying to bring this, or bring this animal in. So contacted the, the seller, things just didn't work out. Um, I eventually lost the, the second, or one of the females and the other female lived for many years, but that's the difficulty of uh, bringing these wild animals in. Um, the next picture is a little graphic. I'll, I'll go through it real quick. But shortly after that purchase, 
again, you need, you need to learn from your mistakes, which I didn't hear. I brought in a bunch of other animals. I think we spent probably $1,500 bringing in some clear eared rare animals. Um, something that I really enjoyed, a different type of a gecko that's just not in the hobby. Again, it was wild and brought it in and they, they did not a one made it. Um, and it's frustrating, it's extremely concerning as a breeder to bring in these animals that you want to work with, but even more so to, to lose an animal like these. Um, contacted the, the uh, breeder or the, the person that brought them in, were these wild? Yes, they were. Did you treat them? Did you? And no concern whatsoever about you know going through that process with me. So he and I did work out a trade though. He said, I don't have any of those other animals, obviously, because they, they came from the wild and we just don't get that many in, but I'll send you five of these uh, Gadiotoides, these cave geckos, these uh, Gadiotoides, uh, Luai, uh, Gadiosaurus, sorry, Gadiosaurus, uh, Luai. So he sent five in and uh, they came in and right away I knew that all five were males, which is exactly what you, you don't want. So again, a learning experience. Do I, do, did I learn from that a little bit? I certainly know how to work with wild animals a little bit better. I know the questions to ask, but you know you really have to be, be very leery of working with wild animals, no matter what they are. Now it's my turn. Shipments, what have I shipped out? I've had a really, really, really good uh, success rate. And I've shipped over, I, I don't even want to guess how many animals, <laughs> 500 shipments of animals. Um, I recently got into isopods, and I, I don't know how many people here keep isopods. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it looks like a good number of people. So as you know, there's some, some uh, easier breeding isopods, and there's some that aren't so easy and a little bit more expensive. These are wonderful, wonderful animals, they're beautiful, I love the colors. Um, it's just amazing that to have the opportunity to keep some of these icy pod morphs. Uh, very fortunate. We're now breeding some of the more difficult ones, and, and again, I feel blessed to even be able to work with these. So, my turn, shipment two weeks ago. And again, you know, it's all a matter of, of being careful and learning from your mistakes. About two weeks ago, um, I made a shipment. So in your shipment, what do you need? Well, you obviously need the, the isopods, uh, you need the substrate, something, you know, to keep them a little moist. Uh, we actually put a, a paper towel in the, the shipment as well. Um, I like to throw a little tiny piece of carrot in there, something for them to eat, something that, that keeps them a little bit moister. What else do you need, anybody? What else do you need to ship that isopod group? A lot of packing. You need a lot of packaging within the box so they don't bounce around a, a, a lot. And I we do that with the geckos and the isopods. There's another thing that you need. Do you need temperature control? You, you, you do need sometimes. Control. They're a little bit less, um, yeah. um, they're, they're easier to ship than other animals, a little bit. You need the cups. Well, we have a big, big box of these cups um, because we're shipping um, a lot of these isopods. I got a big bulk quantity. One thing that I didn't do was punch holes in oh, no. the top. Somebody, did somebody say that? Yeah. So we didn't punch holes on top, and my wife helped me with the shipment. We put together this big order, we shipped it out, and it literally within the hour after we got it in the mail, uh, I asked her, did you put holes on the top? No, I thought you did. So there's another check mark that we have to go through when we take these shipments. I've never ever had a problem with geckos, kind of new to the isopods, and sure enough, there's a fail. So uh, we ship isopods ground USPS, and it took three days to get there. Fellow opened them, they crawled out all over the place, not an issue whatsoever, but you know, we got lucky. Yeah. And just something that you have to learn through, you have to work through. So, what's that? You live and learn, but you know, some, a, a mistake like that, a mistake like buying wild when I shouldn't have is hard for me to get over because I see that that's sitting there. A mistake like this, I'll never, ever, ever make that mistake again. Luckily it wasn't a gecko. Luckily it wasn't a gecko. Um, although for geckos, I've had them go um, 10 days in mail and not had issues. Wow, but without yeah. air holes? 
Not with our air holes. <laughs> uh, probably not more than a day without air holes. Um, Rocket Man, you know, Elton John, I had to come up with a snacky title for this. Um, this relates to uh, the breeding efforts that we do at, at Supreme Gecko. We're breeding crusted geckos, we're breeding leopard geckos, uh, we're breeding some really strange and weird geckos. Um, so what does that have to do with fighting? Anyone have any ideas whatsoever? <laughs> when you breed, what potentially could happen? Go ahead. A male and a female not getting along. Male and a female not getting along. What else could happen? Even worse than a male and a female not getting along. Go ahead. One being misgendered. Yes, you said that so nicely. <laughs> yes. Um, the person doing the introduction <coughs> could mis uh, read one of the geckos and think that it's a female and it's actually a male. So this happened to me, and normally when I introduce leopard geckos, I'll go through and I have all the, the numbers marked and everything, do the introduction, and as I'm feeding down the line and moving the geckos, as I'm feeding maybe two tubs or, or cages later, I hear the, the typical tail wagging and thumping of the male being introduced to the female. It didn't take two or three tubs later to hear the destruction in this tub. It was a male and a, and a male. Uh, I realized later, obviously, went over, opened the tub, and had to, to physically separate the, the two animals. Uh, very difficult to see something like that, and you realize the mistake right away. Um, but they separated, and, and you know the, the one uh, secondary male is, is fine, uh, a little bit beat up for the wear, but uh, worked out okay. But again, you know, it's something that I'll learn to kind of watch a little bit closer next time. Um, nice guy. I, I hope I can say that. Um, so, so I'm with Ms. Jugger, it's okay. <laughs> We're just gonna go either way. Um, about four years ago, we had a really good year in breeding crusty geckos. I don't know how many containers that is, but that's probably half of our overflow. And you'll see one of our, our tank, our, one of our racks in just a minute. That's, all, that's our overflow, and that's about half of it. So I had to scramble. Um, and build another rack real quick. So uh, this is a six quart, and we keep uh, one to two small crested geckos in that six quart for about four to five weeks until they're a little bit bigger. Then we start moving them out to bigger containers, 19 quarts for a while, and then their their eventual homes until we can sell them. So I wanted to make a rack that would hold. Um, a bunch of these little six gallon, uh, six gallon, six quarts. And there's the rack. I was pretty proud of it because I could put this together quickly. Uh, you can see there's not really much to this rack. Uh, four legs, uh, some quarter inch plywood, and we've got, I don't know how many pumps that is, somebody can count them, but um, anybody see an issue with this rack? They're bending. <laughs> Why didn't I see that right away? <laughs> um, so I don't know if you can tell, but in the at the bottom, in the middle, there is a little uh, piece that was supposed to hold that up. But I came a little bit short of the ground. I think I measured. I don't know what happened. But anyways, so this rack lasted about one season. It got me through, you know, as as much as I could that one season, I had to tear it down. I was so proud of this rack. <laughs> and even with all the tubs, it was under $75 to do this whole rack of, I think that's probably about 40 tanks or so, or 40 tubs. 36. 36? See how quickly I, I said 40 and you said 36 and I moved on. <laughs> Um, so this is one of the racks that we built. You can see the bigger two by fours. You can see that I think this is uh, probably about half inch plywood. Uh, this, when it was finished, this rack holds 77 tubs and uh, we can fill that up pretty quick with the, the crusty the geckos and then go to the crib keepers again. Again, just learning that whole process and making a mistake and learning off of it. Um, it's a family pet. No, no it's not, it's your pet. So it's great when you can have the wife or your kids or your brothers or sisters 
somebody else in your family help out with your pets and share the passion that you have with your animals. It's a great feeling. Years ago when my uh, three sons were growing up and getting into reptiles, they wanted to do dragons. I thought that's, that's great. So it was a good introduction to nature and gave them a lot of experience. So I think we had three males and we had, I believe, four females. And it worked out great. I was doing shows at the time. The, the Vera Dragons were breeding. They were getting the experience of egg laying and incubation and taking care of the babies. And then girlfriends came around. So um, we made a lot of money for about a year with these Vera Dragons. Um, went to the shows. They got you know their percentage of the sales from the Vera Dragons. It worked out perfect. Girlfriends, sports, everything else. Can, and, now I can't today, Dad, I've got other things going on. So <clears throat> Dad was, you know, the person that took care of the bearded dragons. Um, and that worked out fine for a while, um, but I eventually realized that I would always work on the geckos first, do this, take care of the bugs, do everything, and the bearded dragons were last because it wasn't my passion. So it was quickly, you know, I, I quickly determined that that just wasn't going to, to work out. The kids weren't interested anymore, so I found good homes for all the bearded dragons. You have to, one of the things that I've learned from this experience is always work with the things that you're really, really passionate because you just won't find the time for the things that you're not. It doesn't matter how much money you're making, it's just that's the way it is. Involve friends. Here's another funny story. Um, anybody realize, or under, uh, anybody know what this animal is? It's a chihuahua, which is related to the crusted gecko. Um, the biggest difference between the chihuahuas and crusted geckos is crusted geckos will lay their eggs and then move on. They don't really guard their eggs. You probably know where this is going. <laughs> so I learned this because the very first, uh, and I don't know why I didn't read it somewhere, but the very first chihuahua eggs that I ever got um, that slide here. Hopefully. The very first Chihua eggs that I ever got, I went into the tank and that female was sitting on the eggs, her mouth was open, I realized she's guarding. This is pretty cool behavior. This isn't what I usually see with crusty geckos. So I worked around and I got the eggs out and, and I got a few other shots. Had a friend come over one day and he's helping me with the tank, feeding this and changing water, adding water. And I went to uh, one of our Chihuahua tanks and here's eggs. I thought, this is gonna be fun. Craig, come here, can you help me pull these eggs? So I had the cup and everything. Well, at the time these Chihuahuas were still, well, they are even expensive today. At the time, I think I had, um, all the animals were, were $500 or more. Not that cost is everything about it, it's more about the animals, but Craig, come here, help me with this. So I opened up the tank uh, he picked up the container. He had helped me with uh, crusty gecko eggs many, many times. So he opened it up the container. Here's the female, sure enough, just like I planned, sitting there waiting for him. But he, she was an open mouth. She was just by the eggs. Why is she open by the eggs? I don't know. I, I don't know, Craig. I have no idea. Should I just go ahead and grab her? Yeah, go ahead and grab her. Goes in to grab the eggs, and she nailed him. <laughs> she grabbed hold of his finger. And so what's your first reaction when something bites you? Yank you yank back. Oh no. So, it, you know, what did I think about that? So, <laughs> so he pulls back, the Chihuahua lets go, and I see the Chihuahua tail <laughs> in the air, and luckily I'm right there, and I grab the Chihuahua and roll right back in the nice. So, good lesson. <laughs> good lesson. Yeah, they're coming from the back. It's a baby, but. Oh, it's yeah. so vicious. <laughs> Who has ever had an animal escape? Yep. Is it everybody? Everybody. So why did they escape? What are some of the why did yours escape? I have no idea. I think we so I was like four. So we were six and we got this big weird dragon. I don't know why. I think I think it was just not Okay. So it got out of the tank? Well, I'm not sure. I think it went into like hibernation and it like woke up and it was still fine. <laughs> Who else has had an animal escape? Yeah, um, I had a baby Sandro escape. Um, she was in an exoterra and it has those like slots in the back with these thick cords. 
And I didn't think she could fit through the slots, but she could. <laughs> so I found her, thankfully, like immediately. She was just behind a box on the other side of the room. Um, but I, I closed the slots after that. <laughs> so how long did you stay in that tank? With the slots in the yeah. uh, About a week. About a week. Yeah, we had it for about a week. So she probably roamed around a little bit and found that hole and yeah. made her exit. How about you? Well, it's not a her, but I have a journal one that actually jumped out of his tank and got underneath my bed. So he kept playing the game of like, run forward, run back, go forward, and go back. <laughs> so did you have a top on the tank? We did, except tried to take the top off, and since that was off, he was out and under the bed. I've got a story about that later. Go ahead. Mine is also not a reptile, he's my head. <laughs> and he escaped so many times, but the only time I freaked out about it was his first time doing it. He climbed on top of his water and popped the lid off his cage and wow. went into my room. Smart. And oh yeah, he, most of the time he escaped. He escaped every couple of months. <laughs> but, but because normally I'd clean his cage, so I put him in a smaller cage, and he'd figure out how to pop pop the lid or open the door from the smaller cage, no matter what I did, and get along with the other cage. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd wake up and he'd be on, be on the wheel in his other cage. And then he was... Anybody else with an escaped? I just snake it out and then go behind the tubs and the rack and oh, let other snakes out. That would be awesome. Oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> so, lesson learned? I still need racks, so maybe not. <laughs> go ahead. So, I was cleaning out my snake's cage and I had my mom come over and I was just watching and he called into a speaker. Oh. So how did he get away? Your mom's holding your snake. How did you yeah. 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 So we went to the couch. We had our speaker behind the couch. We went through the couch. Now, you let your mom pull the snake. Anybody else? Yeah. My daughter's yeah. snake. Same, same thing. Right after, like, just a few days after we got her, it's in a tall cage with this big, nice piece of wood going up to the corner. Went up the wood and found a little hole, but she was asleep in the room and she heard it crawling around on the screen top, making this sound. And so we just lowered everything down so we couldn't get up that high anymore until, until she got too big to fit the hole. <laughs> So it's all, again, you know, it goes back to lessons learned. Anybody with crested geckos, has anybody had a crested gecko get out of their enclosure? Yeah. Out of the enclosure? No, out of my hands, yes. <laughs> um, Just by jumping? Yeah, he jumped in right and I had him like in air raid. But he was a frog butt, so I wasn't terribly worried about the tail dropping, but I found him in my laptop. Oh. It was kind of like the, I had it sitting on the floor, which I don't do anymore, and I had like the, Top tilted and then like the base layer, and he was wedged there, kind of probably because it was really warm, I guess. But we tore the whole apartment apart, and we just found him sitting on the laptop. He was surfing the internet. Pretty much. And I was like, silly. Ordering pizza. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we took well, the cat in the bathroom. But whenever an animal escapes, our first thing that even the husband knows grab that cat. Yeah. Yes. I bet I get at least one question. I get a lot of questions daily uh, at Supreme Gecko, and at least once a month, somebody's lost their crest of gecko. How do I find it? I've actually you know, written an article, and I don't like to, to just say, hey, go look at this article. I like to kind of uh, find out if there's something that I can do right away. But I also refer to the article, and the thing with uh, a lot of these animals, especially crested geckos, is look high. You know, be patient. Everything's the world isn't ending right now. Except if you have the bats. <laughs> so you have to worry about things like that outside influences. But in a house without any animals, an a crusty gecko, a leopard gecko, even a snake, they can they can find their way around pretty well. Um, but I always say look up, look for warm places, look up under TV, uh, look on the curtains, look always look up um, because it happens. Um, except for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have the interesting case, huh? I, I do. I, I have the, the, the 20 years of, of bad experiences. Um, so what happened with me a long, long time ago, and I uh, left 
Uh, I've had crusty geckos get out occasionally. Let's see if I can. Is that just loose? Well, that didn't work. Talk about failure. Um, I'll just kind of. Oh, yeah, 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 very good. Thanks. That's a while we're back in. Yeah, he's been all over the world. He actually worked this year. Just back. He's been in Japan and India, Italy, then China for three weeks. He does not speak India to anybody. <laughs> so I had an experience with a crusty gecko getting out uh, years and years ago. Um, uh, kind of timed out. I think it's been I walked into our our crusty gecko room. I, I have a facility downstairs. Everything's in our basement, and it's different rooms. And I walked into the crusty gecko room at the time, and I don't know if you hunt or fish, but if you do either one of those sports or, or other sports, you get aware of your your environment. I know as a fisherman. If I'm out fishing, I can hear, you know, the, the, a lily pad bounce or a, a wave over here. You just get attuned to, to your environment. I think I'm sure it's the same way. Well, I walked into the Crusty Gecko room and I knew immediately one of the doors was ajar. Hmm. And it was open, you know, quite a bit. It was a screen cage, the door was open. Geckos are gone. Geckos hmm. have to be gone. So I walked over and sure enough, the, the Crusty Geckos were, were out of the enclosure. I looked around, nothing, no Crusty Geckos whatsoever in the enclosure. Um, it didn't take me but about two minutes to realize that one of them, so the tank was, the uh, screen tank was on the bottom and I had a screen tank on top. One of them was sitting on the, the tank above and it had to be within maybe 24 hours or as long, I should say as long as 24 hours because I, I fed and I went downstairs the next day at night and sure enough this crust gecko was sitting just within four feet of his original tank. Um, I went into my lever gecko room and came out probably a half hour later. Here's the other one on the shelf, not two feet away from his original cage. <laughs> so I don't think, you know, they're, they're aware of, oh my gosh, I'm out. I need to run as far as I can to get away from, from this cage that I've been kept in. I think it's more, you know, I'm comfortable in this area. I, I know this area. It's a, oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, <laughs> It's my territory, so I'm comfortable right here. That doesn't mean that they don't run. Um, I've had, if anybody has had day geckos, which are super fast. Oh, day geckos? Gosh. Oh, gosh. Um, I have a day gecko out right now. It's a little um, uh, Laticata Laticata. It's the uh, gold dust day gecko. It, it got out um, through a crack that I didn't realize. And um, it's been out for about three days. But today, I went downstairs. I have actually three different groups of these uh, uh, gold dust geckos because they're just beautiful, beautiful animals. One of my favorites, one of my passions, one of the animals I'll always, always, always keep in the hobby. So the far left tank, uh, one got out and I was walking past the other tanks and turned to my left and saw it on the back of the tank, on the back of the Exoterra. So for the next hour I spent maneuvering and sticks and cups and I'm ready <laughs> an inch at a time and sure enough when I got the, the, the stick all the way where all I had to do was move it a little bit for it to come out to the face of the, the tank it went all the way down under the stick and probably four rooms down from where it was so but you know having said that I know that that animal will be back to those other geckos at some point so I just have to maybe wait it out um so I've got two different, well that was, I guess, my second story, but I have a third story now. I get to do these stories all the time. <laughs> uh, so somebody mentioned uh, something that was really quick, uh, a hamster or a gerbil that got out and it was so quick that it just, it bolted on me. And I had the same story with, I used to keep micro geckos and I kept them in 10 gallon tanks with screen tops, which is not the right way to keep them because they're super fast. You open up the screen and they, they sometimes run. Well, this group uh, was lighter back, it was Kim Paula, a beautiful little maybe two and a half inch gecko, um, gray with stripes, um, and super fast but predictable. 
Uh, they were always, you know, if I opened the, up the tank, I could watch them, I could open up the tank, they could stay in their same position, I could put the, the food in. This time it didn't work. Open up the tank, and I could just see it looking at me. I thought, I, I can do this. I'll open up the tank, and just maybe that much or something before I end and put the food in. Open up the tank, and it jumped up the side, across the lid. I think I almost blinked. I think I almost blinked. Up the arm, <laughs> down the, on the floor, and under the furnace. Oh, that quick. That quick. Um, now, having said that, just like the day geckos, the uh, gold dust, I found this one next day right on top of that same tank, it was easy, and it was easily caught by putting a cup under it and, and catching it. So, you know, that's one lesson learned is that these animals, <coughs> some of these animals, like their their own, you know, place where they, they've always been, and they'll go back and visit that. Did I learn to not let animals, and, and did I learn to close doors all the time? I'm getting better. <laughs> I'm getting there. What's your, so I've got a couple more stories here before it gets too late, but what I'd like to hear is if you have any of these lesson learned kind of stories. Anybody with a snake, something that you've done and it, it was one of those, oh my gosh, why did I do that? Or I learned the lesson because this animal did something. I heard a great story about the, the uh, non-reptiles. Anybody else with any kind of stories? Interested in hearing anybody else? Okay, I have an iguana and cat story. When I was in college, I had this black cat and also an iguana. He was living in a 55 gallon tank with a screen top. And the cat liked to get up on the top of the tank and torment the iguana by sitting there on top looking at the iguana. And I always knew because when I'd open the door, the cat would usually come running to me, and if the cat didn't come running to me, I knew he was up there and he was hoping I would notice. <laughs> so he built the iguana a little, like a box, to go under so that he wouldn't feel like he was being tortured by the cat staring at him. Unfortunately, that enabled him to climb up and pop his lid. <laughs> so I come home, open the door, I don't hear the cat, and I'm like, oh no, he's on top of the iguana cage. So I go over to the iguana cage, and it's open. I'm like, oh no, he got the iguana. And I call the cat, and then I say, no. And he's very stuffed back in the very back underneath the desk. And the iguana is sitting in front of the desk like this. <laughs> <laughs> the tables have turned. <laughs> <laughs> I have one that's more sad. That's okay. Because I'm smart, I went from green and alls to Chinese water dragons. So, because I was out there, I got this big massive tank and all that. So I have the dog set up and all that. And I opened the lid just to, I don't know what it was, just to move something. And I think he either ran up my arm or I picked him up for a second. Not even a half second, he ran across the table because he was on my kitchen table. Because the cheese for reptiles, not food. <laughs> It, it was not even half a second and the cat grabbed him. Oh. And she took off running with him. He was a baby. He's a baby. And my dog, who's been around exotics his whole entire life, he's like, eh, yep, I don't want nothing to do with this random crate right now because he's smart. And he still is up to this day, thankfully. And the cat just took off running and I grab her tail. And I yank her back. And she's clawed, but I'm like, you get fucked back here. Unfortunately, right as I got her, she went to reposition him and put a canine right through the room. And I learned cat goes in the bathroom when I have reptiles out, even just for a second. It's it's hard Never when you're keeping since. animals like that. We had a guinea pig, a kind of a very similar story, uh, with a little bit of a different ending. But we had a guinea pig that we kept in a 20 gallon wad in our spare bedroom. This is when my wife and I first got married. And we had a, a case on, a dog. Case on, if anybody knows what that is. Hard. Kind of a husky looking cat. Do you have one? I used to have one for first dog. Greatest dog ever. Yes, we, we had two of them. We were blessed to have both of them. But this was our first dog, but she got in everything. Uh, we came home one day and found a bunch of wood stuff on the, the living room floor. Couldn't figure it out, couldn't figure it out, and finally found a little piece that identified 
that she had eaten through the whole wooden coaster set. And the, the pieces were so small. So this is the type of dog she had. She, I came home one day, opened the door, and she's sitting on the, the uh, couch, and she had been downstairs. I must have had my tackle box on the latch. I don't know why. Uh, I guess I do that out of habit now. But um, she had gotten my filet knife, brought it upstairs, walked in the door. Here she's on the, the um, couch in the living room, one paw on the handle, one paw on the blade, and she's eaten almost all the wood off from the handle. She looked up at me like, hey, how's it going? You have a good day? <laughs> so after all of this, she tore a whole wall of, of uh, wallpaper off of our bathroom. Um, so after all of this, we, my wife and I had gone somewhere. We came in, the guinea pig, we always closed the door on the bedroom. 20 gallons, shavings, you kind of know the story. We, we opened the door and here there are shavings all over the kitchen, all over the kitchen. And you know, when you see something like this, this is not gonna be good at all. This is gonna be bad. So we walk through the house and get into the hallway. The shavings are leading right to the bedroom, to the spare bedroom. We kind of open the door real slow, and the dog won't come. So we're, I'm kind of thinking, this is really bad. She knows she's bad. And I, you know, we kind of open the door here in this 20 long, picture this Keyshawn sitting on one end and sit, seeing the, the guinea pig at the other end just kind of huddled into the corner. Oh, and, and she was like, it won't play with me. I don't know what to do. It won't play with me. So, uh, luckily a good ending to that story. Yeah. Yeah. I had any more about that. I do have one last like, one interesting cat story right. that I am just getting so sick and tired of seeing. All over the place, my first time I ever got up, my cat aged in my cage. So that happened to me one time. You know those Zilla, the Zilla rock hides? So yeah. my leopard gecko loves to hang out in hers. And my cat was just laying on top of her cage like she always does. And it was a 20 long with just a plain screen. She's just laying on it and a couple of minutes later, the whole thing caves. And I'm like, oh my gosh, well, the gecko was totally fine, but I need a new cage, but I need a new cage now. So I made a run to Rut Colorado and got next with Tara. And then one thing I kind of kind of cooked up in my head, since I'm like, that she still pushes on the screen, still can cave in, how can I prevent this? She's not gonna stop laying on the top. This I know. And she never did, she never stopped. So I actually found a little life hack that I use. It works best on the extra pairs because they've got those supports. I use sushi bamboo mats. Okay. It's like five dollars for six of them, and they're about this big, they're like this big, but they're strong and they're flexible, and air gets through and it supports cats. Wait. Just enough support. So I put a bunch of those on top of them and also added plus with the crusty geckos to keep some humidity. But I put I put those on until it's completely covered and then I duct tape them back with whatever I want and I've never had an issue. Oh. And it works perfect and it's bamboo, it's natural, and it, you still get the airflow. And I mean, I've never had an issue. The cats jump on it. The reptiles see, don't seem to care. In fact, the reptiles will chase it back. <laughs> That's so pretty funny to see. You're taking a fail and you're improving on this situation. Yeah, so it's you. hard to describe it to people, but I'm like, people do this. That's like a five dollar thing, <laughs> and it's going to save you from having to do a one hundred plus dollar run in the middle of the night. <laughs> Let me tell you about the last oh, couple of fails that I have. Um, um, so. Yeah. Here's a big mistake. Once on Facebook, I mentioned I keep my leopard geckos on sand. <laughs> oh no! no. Don't just don't mention stuff on Facebook. Don't 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 do that. Leopard geckos and substrate. I don't have it. The unfortunate thing with Facebook, I think, especially in the recent years, is it's getting a little bit worse and worse. It, for people, for new people jumping onto a social media platform like this. Um, they're, they're getting a lot of ridicule, uh, being called names, and it's just something that, that I don't believe in whatsoever because I made these mistakes. And the last thing that I wanted to hear was you're, you're not doing it the right way. I was going to say something way worse, but you're not doing it the right way. You need to do it like this. What are you thinking? So uh, one point that's off of this is maybe in the beginning, I, I got some of that backlash. 
and it changed my perception of how I need to treat other people, getting into the hobby, making these same mistakes, or not knowing enough to, to do it the right way. What is the problem with picking up a deck and don't say? What's that? What's the problem with picking up a deck and don't That's a good question. <laughs> and, and the thing is that, that you know, if you don't do it or if you haven't read, then you don't know. It's not a matter that you want to do it wrong or that, that somebody told you, you know, do it like this and, and you've been doing it for a long time. You just don't know. So the problem with keep anybody keeping leopard geckos on sand? When they're really little babies, if they eat, they eat some leopard geckos. What's that? I'm sorry. When they're really little babies, you have to worry about them eating too much of it. I, I would tend to completely agree. It, Rebecca mentioned also it's an impaction issue. So the thing with leopard geckos is in, in the wild, they lick. They look for their minerals. They, they look for their substance or supplements. And they're always looking. They're, they're trying to get the salts and whatever they can, can in their bodies. In the wild, they're not kept over real fine, uh, loose materials. They're always on something that's firm. So when they look, it's actually you know getting those materials into their bodies. So if you keep them over sand and they don't have somewhere else to lick, they're going to lick the sand. It's just going to impact them. So after years and years, I don't tell people, don't keep your leopard geckos over sand. What I say is, make absolutely positively sure that you have some kind of a dish with calcium in it. <coughs> Shouldn't keep your leopard geckos over sand, but if that's what you want to do, I'm, I'm not going to be here to tell you that's the worst thing possible, but absolutely have some kind of substance in your, your leopard geckos, and leopard gecko enclosures for them to look to get their, their minerals from. Do you know what impaction is? No. Yeah. Good. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. Impaction is you see a lot of dogs where they'll eat something they're not supposed to, then your intestines are only so so large. You get blockage in there so nothing can pass. So if you can't eat and you can't poop, you except you starve or you can get some major injuries and it's usually death unless you get it surgically treated. So the best thing absolutely to do with baby leopard geckos or adult leopard geckos, and we're not really here to talk about leopard geckos, but it's a great point that you just made, is that you really, really shouldn't keep them over sand. Uh, but you, that's another point. The main point is keep some kind of a lick dish in there for them to lick out of, uh, to get their calcium, to get their vitamins and vitamins. So this is more of a joke, but I just wanted to point out that you know, if anything, if, if you, if somebody asks you a question, treat them like they don't know, and you're the educator, you're there, it's your responsibility now, especially being in a community like this, it's your responsibility to teach them. Uh, last couple of uh, <laughs> stories here, insects, they're your best friend. So we go through crickets. We go through probably, I want to say, 6,000 crickets every three or four weeks. 6,000 crickets. And that's besides the dubias and the mealworms that we're feeding. So we're going through a lot of crickets. Crickets are our friend. Mealworms are our friend. Uh, dubia, dubias are our friend. Um, crickets are probably our least friend. Um, anybody know why with crickets? What, what's the bad thing about crickets? Let's we'll stop like three or four. Go ahead. They stink. They stink. Absolutely. We're going to come back to that point too. They're noisy. They're noisy. So have you ever had a cricket get out in the house? Or no. Out? So what do you do? Keep them in the ground. Yeah. Keep them in the ground. I don't like that. That point. What else? So they stink. They're they're noisy. They die. They die easily. They bite. They bite. They bite you or they bite. You bite. Why? You, I, you're, you got it. I was trying to lead you in that direction, but you're right on. So they bite because people feed a lot of them. I want my gecko to be fat and ready to breed. So I'm going to throw a lot of crickets in the enclosure, and the gecko eats two or three, and then all the others gang up on the gecko and bite. Absolutely. We, you know, we strongly, strongly, you know, try to teach people that the best thing to do is put a couple in, walk away, a couple come back in an hour or so. If you see some still in there, don't don't feed anymore. And in fact, you want to get those those out. 
So what do we say, I'm sorry, stink, uh, they're noisy, they die easy, um, they fight. fight, what else? Yeah, we're just piling up on, on crickets. Go ahead. <laughs> they escape. They, they escape easy. Why do they escape easy? Because they jump. Right. So you pull out a container, you pull out something that you got them in, and all of them go like that, all over the place. So they, squeeze, the, they also yeah. squeeze through a little bit of cracks. So we don't think they the cracks. They're just hard to manage. They're absolutely hard to manage. So why do we go through what, you know, four, six thousand every three to four months? Exactly. They're plentiful. They're plentiful. They're cheap. Yeah. Uh, they're. I think they're a very, very good food source. And I say that, and I'll throw in two words um, right after that that I wouldn't absolutely talk about insects, uh, crickets being good for a nutritional diet for animals and geckos, without saying you know gut load and dust them. Uh, so if, if you're buying crickets at a, a pet store, you get home and you're feeding them to your animals. Not good, not good at all. Even if you, even if it's a great, great pet store like Reptile Rapture, I never ever get a, a gecko. Even we get a lot shipped in. Obviously, I'm not going to get a, go to a pet store and get you know four, six thousand crickets. Um, we get them shipped in. We can, you know, we condition them up. We feed them grains and and uh, light vegetables, and then after a couple of days, then we pound them with, with carrots and kale and you know, good, strong, fibrous uh, kind of vegetables and gut load them, and even after doing that, when we're ready to feed, after a couple hours of them gut loading, we'll still dust them so that we give the animals, the geckos, as much nutritional value out of those meals as we possibly can. So crickets are good, they're, they're bad, but they're also good. So I'm gonna go back to the statement that you made that they stink. They, they do smell, and, there's, and, and they die quickly. There's ways to get around that when you bring in uh, crickets. We get around that bit by keeping them the right way. And, and there's a couple of tricks like about that, and I'm not going to get too much into that other than saying if you have questions about keeping crickets alive, shoot me an email, uh, catch me on Facebook, and we can talk about that. However, they smell if you forget about them. So we get 4,000 crickets, and we have these. We keep about 1,000 in a, I don't know, 30 or 40 quart bucket. And so 1,000, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000. And then we start feeding off of the different buckets. Well, occasionally I'll, I don't have room downstairs, so I'll throw a bucket over here, throw a bucket over there, throw a bucket under a rack, <laughs> and forget about it for a week and a half. And you walk down, I walk downstairs, it's like, oh my gosh, what died? So, so you do this, and the last thing that you want to do now is go to a tub of a thousand crickets that are all dead. <coughs> so you're not going to find crickets, you're going to find cricket soup. And there's nothing worse than finding cricket soup. Oh, oh, it is that bad. bad. <laughs> so they're your friends, they're their worst enemies. I hope nobody else has a story like that. <laughs> I forgot. What is this? Dubia. It's an adult male dubia. Anybody keep dubias? Tried. Tried. <laughs> Everybody. Uh, why do you keep dubias? Come too cheap to buy food. Yeah, so uh, me too. Me too. I'm cheap. Um, I, I can't afford to, to constantly buy four to six thousand crickets, so I've converted over quite a bit to dubias. I still get the crickets because I want to give the animals a balanced diet and different different feeding uh, responses out of my animals, but, oh, dubious. Dubious are a godsend. Um, so that's the good thing. What else is good about dubious? They can't climb plastic. They can't climb plastic, perfect. Anything else about dubious that, that's good? They eat almost anything. They don't smell, they eat almost anything. They don't bite. They don't bite. Aren't they, don't bite. Aren't they more nutrition? Uh, maybe, maybe. How's that? They have a higher protein They do. I, so I'm on the fence of you gut load, you dust, and it's. Yes. You better be doing. I'm thinking you better be doing one of those two things with your insects, and especially gut loading. You know. Absolutely. So at that point, the nutritional value. Uh, do you feed your your crickets the the water gel with the calcium? It's such a waste. You know, dust your animals, feed them carrots. Mm -hmm. It's 
that's more of a personal, but he acts like he likes the dubious like taste vibes better than the meal and cooked chicken. So you you send you, you've got this enclosure with crusty geckos in it, and you have a, a substrate of uh, what is a, a jungle mix. Um, you have this substrate of jungle mix that's about an inch deep in your crusty gecko enclosure, or whatever reptile, and you throw in four cr uh, crickets. What are they going to do? What's that? Mine go down to the bottom, they burrow in, they find a little crevice, they find wherever they can to hide. Um, my crickets do. So they go right behind the background. So what a waste. Um, but why don't I put them in a dish? How about dubious? So, has anybody seen the mealworm cups? The mealworm yes. dishes with a little rim? Um, so, really, the mealworms can't get up. Here's a trick, and it especially works with dubious, it even works with crickets. So, what I'll do with my crusted geckos, I have you know, hundreds of containers with crusted geckos, I have uh, mealworm cups in every single one. I'll, I've got the dust in the, the meal cup. I dust the crickets. I don't feed four to an enclosure with a crusted gecko. I'll feed two. And I'll walk all the way around and then I'll start feeding again. It takes twice the amount of work, but when I come back, those crickets usually, sometimes they will jump out, but usually they're doing the circle or the crusted gecko has already eaten them, depending on the time. But they'll usually just kind of circle around and around and around. Dubious absolutely will do that. They'll stay in. The, the mistake that you can make with dubias is that you load up that meal and cup with dubias. You know, you put five or six, and then they they form a ladder. I think they smart. Yes, I didn't think anybody would get the reference. <laughs> I got you, Mom. I got you. Kind <laughs> <laughs> of that mind melt kind of thing. So they'll they'll dubias will climb out. So I don't put that many. I'll put two in there and let the animals find the dubias and eat the, the dubias. Just gonna say it depends, like also how fast the animal's going to eat them. Yes. Like I was, because yes. I was showing you the station, you put 25 in one of those, and they weren't able to escape. Yeah. Also, he ate all of them in four days, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I, for, especially for crickets, uh, dubious, I'm a little bit less concerned about. Mealworms, I'm more concerned about, but I won't feed more than they'll eat in about a day. Um, and actually, you know, if I'm feeding every other day, my leopard geckos especially, I'm going through those mealworm cups, and I'll talk about mealworms for just a second. I'll go through those mealworm cups, and I'll open them up, and I'll put them in another container that I have. So any uneaten mealworms, right out of that mealworm cup, and new ones go in. Then when I'm done feeding everything, these used or older, which they're so good, mealworms, will go into another bin, and I'll raise them up for the larvae and the beetle so that I can start the whole process over. Um, the reason, anybody know the reason I do that? Remember what I said earlier about insects? You want to dust them and you want to gut load them. After about eight hours, they're passing whatever value of the gut load that they have in them. And it's just, you might as well just dump them. They're, the value of the insect is depleted quite a bit within that first eight hours or so. Um, I'm eventually getting to my point here. So, <laughs> uh, I think that's the last slide. Dubious. I'll finish it off on, on this and see if there's any questions. Um, the worst thing about dubious is that in my mind, it's, it's, I don't want them escaping. I don't want dubious anywhere in our house. We have kids. What's that? Here we go. You ready for this? Fasten the seatbelt. So uh, years and years ago, I, I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll harvest the, the small dubious, put them in a bin, and then when I'm ready to feed, again, I'll throw the carrots in, Couple hours later, come back through, and I'll collect my dubias in a tall. What is that? A 32 ounce deli cup, the taller ones, the fruit fly cups. I'll collect them in the cups, and then I'll go through and I'll feed. I'll get everything ready, and then I'll go into my leopard gecko room, which is uh, another room away from our crusty gecko room. It's another room away from my actually our bug room now. So I'll, I'll collect the, the bugs, and then I'll go and feed. Well, one day. I collected them in the 32, I don't know if I do over the top bottle, 
So I collected everything, put the cup down to grab something else to turn. And as I'm turning, I can see the cup teetering. <laughs> this is a cup of dubious, little teeny tiny dubious. And this was a room that my wife had for daycare. So it's carpeted. And it has racks in it. And it has supplies. And it has every little tiny place to hide. And this cup is about that full. So what is that about? This is like 3.2 million. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a worse one, and you know where I can go with that. Um, so I've got about this much dubious, and teeter teeter, and I turn, oh. I can catch it, and I reach and it falls on the floor, <laughs> and they just go. So now, oh now they're they're on the floor, and I have a barrier. I've got all the tubs encircling like like the old westerns with the, <laughs> and they're all encircling these dubias and I'm trying to pick up somebody mentioned later I should have taken a wet back and put a ankles or something on it and then just scoop them off and then oh, yeah, yeah, cool. yeah, yeah I didn't think of that for the three hours I was sitting on the floor collecting <laughs> dubias. Please don't let my wife like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's exactly that. Let me find every single one of these, please. So, dubious can be your friends, but they can be your enemies. I've done that with the crickets. I, I'm not so worried about the crickets because the crickets will die. They just, with the moisture, they need the moisture and everything. In our basement, they'll, you know, unfortunately, they, you know, I collect them. I dump a couple baby crickets. I've done that a couple of times. I can at least collect most of them. The others, I figure, will we'll eventually die. And in the basement, it's not so much an issue, but the duty is another mindset. Oh, yeah. So, failures and lessons learned. Hopefully, I've learned something over these 20 years. Hopefully, you guys have gotten something out of this. I never put that many dubias on a <laughs> in a daycare area. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions whatsoever? More of a comment. Please. So, if I were actually in that situation, what would your cup of dubious or how you would have them? And it tipped over, then I would actually be, well, if there were crickets, I would be actually the same amount of, it would still be the same amount of worry for me because once they die, they start to smell. Yeah. yeah. And then you had that all over the place. So this was an old daycare, so we had the room for daycare that I, I, uh, I don't know, I, I confiscated it. <laughs> <laughs> My wife said I stole it from the gecko, so it's dubious daycare. Under, like, did she have a carpet, like, like the carpet in my room? Yeah, and like, these little, like, little black things, like, little, like, cat rooms, where it kind of, like, weird, and there's, like, a space that you can wander, so it's like, and you just like you can't exactly move out. Believe me, Judy will do the same thing. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Question. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So I can't go. I can't go. I can't go. And there was a male in there. This male was huge, probably two or three inches long. So he was huge, and he was just so loud. I got a chill up for this. So I show up and one woman was like, Here's dinner. So it's picked up, here are the dragons. Lunged. Yep. Gone. <laughs> like, Fine. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, like, I can hear them all the way from the room and from my bedroom. They didn't jump off their hand and find no. the place. Drake, this is your birthday. You put them in the the, 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 the rec island enclosures, it's like chunk them. But but if they're around the house, they look for days and days and months and years. Any other comments? Any other questions? Well, have you ever had a situation where you did something wrong with quarantine and it caused you some problems? Um, um learned with quarantine. Quarantine is a tough one. I'm gonna rule. You know, I'm sure I have with rough house, but I'm going to relate a fish story, if you don't mind. Um, still a lesson learned. <laughs> still a lesson learned. So, 
as obsessed with geckos and isopods as I am today, I was more obsessed in my 20s with tropical fish. And I would bring tropical fish in from all over the place, from Germany, uh, it didn't matter. I was shipping tropical fish all, all over the place too, and I had some of the, some pretty rare fish. Um, I had, if anybody knows a tropical fish, you know, one of the kings of the tropical fish is discus. And I had four breeding pair of discus, and I had, I had four back, four hatch, hatchlings back of every single one of those sold. So I would get about 20 babies per spawn of these discus. So I had, what is that, 20, 40, 60, 80, I don't even know. They, they were all sold. Um, our third son was born, he had some issues. <laughs> about that same time, I had brought in some of the, the rarest epistogram, which are really teeny tiny little cheap fish from South America, but nobody had these at the ground. It's only a couple of people around that I knew of had these and I had to have them, brought them in, put them in a 10 gallon tank, talking about quarantine, always, always, always set them aside, work on them the very last and wash and sterilize them. Everybody knows what to do with uh, quarantine animals. And I do that for the fish I did it for a month, for the geckos, another tank, last ones I work on all the time. I've never had, I don't think I've ever had any issues with the geckos, but um, with these panda histograms, uh, brought them in, put, in, put them in a 10 gallon tank, and trouble with our, our youngest son, had some, some issues when he was born, and for two or three days, I'd go down and just as quick, beep, 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 get out of there as quick as possible so I could get to the hospital with my wife. Um, when I did that, I must have, gone through with the net or uh, feeding tube with brine shrimp or something and not paid attention and gone through. So I went downstairs um, after about a week and here my, my eight discus, um, one pair was okay, one male or female was okay, the other one was dead, then the other two pairs were dead and throughout the whole fish room I had here and there some dead animals. So. It was emergency cleanup, sterilization, but you know, to lose two pair, three pair of spawning discs was really, really tough at that time. Yeah. That was a big one. Did you have a question? At that time, and I'll follow that up with, uh, at that time, I made the realization, this is when I was developing my career, fish was just taking, I had 125 tanks downstairs, and most of them were 50 gallons. Um, at that time, I had to make that decision, do I keep moving forward with this? I moved forward with my career and I decided to drop the fish. Sold all of the tanks, all the fish, my, my everything. Everything went out of the house on a Saturday. Everything was gone. But it was because of the family and I wanted to make sure that. So the family was first and then I had to decide between my career and, and the fish and the fish was lost. Another uh, question? You do have a question from Angie Schwartz. Angie. So, Yep, Angie Schwartz wants to know, so with crickets, if you were to put them in a substrate with spring tails and isopods, would that take care of the smell of dead ones? If you had spring tails and isopods, it absolutely would if you had some dye. Um, unfortunately, you know, I, I think that, that isopods and spring tails right now are, are so popular and everybody's, you know, getting into that between one of two different reasons. One, they want the bioactive and, you know, they want these isopods and, and spring tails to help as a cleaner group or people are collecting them. I've, I've got the dwarf whites and a couple of others as cleaning crew, uh, and I, but most of my isopods are more from a collection standpoint. Um, from a cleaning crew though, they can just do so much. They're not going, if you dump in 10 crickets and your animal eats two of them and the other eight die, um, the cleaning crew just can't handle that kind of a load. They just can't. So my suggestion would be, you know, if, if you're feeding white, then they'll take care of, you know, a load like that, not if you're misfeeding, I guess. Don't don't look for these cleaning crews to, to make up for some of your mistakes. Not that Angie is making that. Any other questions? What's your favorite gecko? Um, what day is it? Um, <laughs> I actually did a list of my favorite yeah. geckos. You, I, I did it. I Crested Gecko was like three. I can't remember the one. Crested Gecko might have been down like four or five or six. Uh, no, and it's not five. 
Was it in the top five? Crested geckos are certainly one of my top uh, five animals um, because we have so many and, and I love the colors and, and everything. I want to say my favorite ant, my favorite gecko was probably the um, the gold dust gecko, uh, the day gecko. Because they're small, um, they have beautiful green colors and they're red colors. But most importantly for me is they're, they're easy to care, they're easy to breed, um, but if you get them at the right angle, it looks like you're looking out over an ocean and seeing all the waves with the, the golden color and shimmering. They're just a beautiful, beautiful animal. So it's either that or, or another color of animals that I can get. It's probably the gold dust. Oh, we have another question from Angie Schwartz. Uh, she's going to yell at me now. Angie would like to know, will you be breeding millipedes soon with a big smiley face? I have millipedes. Um, so I have ivory millipede breeding, and I have uh, bumblebee uh, millipedes breeding. Uh, I'm working on um, ivory, and I'm working on a couple more millipedes. Uh, but I don't have first breeding because she only gave me uh, three females. <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell Angie she needs to find me a mail for those three females. She's right. watching you on the live feed. Angie, yeah. send me a mail. <laughs> are the millipedes for food or are they a pet? Also? It's a pet. Okay. It's absolutely a pet. It's, for me, it's all a learning experience and trying different things. Uh, I've gone out collecting for ice pods and millipedes and brought some in. I brought some in last fall. They really sustained themselves, but this spring once it started warming up again. I'm getting tons and tons and tons of babies from these lots of milkies. It's all learning so I can share some information. Awesome. She says hush. <laughs> <laughs> so do you breed your own dubias and mealworms? I do, I absolutely do. So and, um well my question is how do you separate your mealworms? Um, I don't have a good way. To be very honest, um, I'm learning still. So what I'll do, no, it's a, so we have probably 50 pods of baby geckos that need small foods. Um, so having that many baby gecko tubs, um, we need a lot of baby mealworms. Um, so I have bins of mealworms. I, I mentioned before that I collect the, the mealworms that haven't been eaten. I put them in another bin, I start with another bin, and let them go through that process. So we do a lot of feeding of these mealworms. So what I'll do is, is when I'm ready to harvest some baby mealworms, um, I'll take a potato and I'll slice it kind of thin, and I'll put it down at three or four spots. Then I'll go work on something else, and 10, 15, 20 minutes later, I'll come back and I'll take that potato and just scrape them off into a, a deli cup. If somebody has a better way of collecting mealworm, small mealworms than that. I've tried sifting, I've tried many other methods, and that seems to be the best way that I've found. Well, I'm usually trying for the bigger ones, and what I do is I take like the kitchen strainer, what you use for like the anudas, mm -hmm. but then I still get small ones mixed in with my big ones. Yep, so what I do in that case, if I have, if I have a bin that's a little bit more mature, so I've collected small mealworms out of it for quite a while, now I've been, I'm getting more and more bigger ones, um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just let it go, and then I'll, I'll do the same exact thing. I'll start another bin, new material, new wheat or whatever, and I'll sift down as much as I can, and I'll get the, the bigger mealworms, and then I'll take that other, and I'll put it right on top of the new bin. And usually by that time, they've eaten the wheat pretty, pretty far down, and that new bin will be, be the start of a, another bin. Angie was mentioning that a fishnet was also a good option. Now Fish. you asked about your air conditioner? It's working. Oh, okay. Tell her, tell her that it's not 115 degrees in our house anymore. <laughs> um, Angie, it's not 115 degrees in his house. Angie. <laughs> Hi, Angie. Um, a uh, fishnet is good, a, any kind of a strainer is good. The problem is that your, your uh, material that you're breeding them in is going to be about the same size as the mini mealworms and to separate that. The only way that I've found is to, to either you know, put a piece of potato or clear off a whole section of the tub and then put your potato or whatever over there and, and give it you know, hours and eventually those mealworms will come over. But you're still going to get big and little and you still have to scoop them up from there. It's not, so you want the little ones, I want the big ones. So. I want the little ones. So I'll give you some big ones for your little ones. <laughs> <laughs>
We got to figure out how to separate them, so. Exactly. Anybody else? Yeah. Do you have ever any problems with babies eating their children? Eating what? Their babies. Their babies. Um, a lot of ideas on that. And if anything that I, you know, I don't say I'm an expert in the hobby on a lot of things, but I feel pretty comfortable with the real ones just because we've been doing this for so long. And the um, neurons, the dubious, we're, we're growing a lot of different bugs. And because we have so many geckos to feed, you know, I have to be good at, at raising some bugs for them. I can't afford to keep going out and getting 6,000 crickets every, every few weeks. So uh, to your point about the dubious, what I'll do is I'll, I'll be, and almost everybody does this, they take the egg cartons and they line them up in with the bin that you're breeding. And our bins are about 80 cores, so they're really big bins. We've got four of them going at a time. Um, so we feed them and then uh, we also allow them to get kind of a little dirty on the bottom. But we also put about half of an inch of wheat or half of an inch of oats. And a lot of people suggest not to do that because the oats or the wheat will get uh, wet and get moldy and sink. And we, I don't find that because I'll take just a, a pea, uh, I'll take a paper plate, a round paper plate, a small one, like you get a uh, birthday cake on. And I'll put that right on top and then I'll feed off of that. So if I'm feeding like a, a potato or bananas or, or carrots, I'll throw that right on there. And, you know, I looked up a couple of the, the um, egg cartons, put that plate under, put the food on, put the egg cartons right on so that they can get in and out of there. And uh, I have no issues with um, the, the material on the bottom of the substrate getting moldy or wet or anything, or, and certainly not smelling. Um, as far as the babies, what they'll do then is when they're when they're young, they'll go into that substrate and they'll they'll live in the substrate. Mm -hmm. Be that be that substrate the wheat or the oats or eventually you know shape what do you call it? shape or shaft and that other material. Um, you were you were asked if you have any tips on hissing the cockroaches. I don't. I've never kept hissing cockroaches. Um, I keep only do. I should be talking to the, the screen. I, I keep only uh, dubious right now. I keep dubious and a really, really teeny tiny one, uh, Schwarz. I think they're called. I can't remember. Um, but years and years ago, I kept uh, Turkish um, lobster roaches. Okay. So talk about failures. I'll, I'll, this is going to be my last right now. Everybody's ready to go. So I, I that because the day geckos love these fast moving lobster roaches. If anybody knows lobster roaches, we talked about dubious not being able to climb. Lobster roaches can. So I had a tank with these day geckos and they were gorgeous, laying eggs all the time. I'd go in and their plants and I'd collect the eggs and, and hatch out some really nice looking uh, baby day geckos, um, these giant day geckos. But I fed them a lot of these uh, lobster roaches and I had the, the top of the, the uh, 20 high, extra high, lined with a, something called a bug border. So they couldn't, if anybody's used this great stuff, they can't climb up, it's like a silicone, they can't go past that border, they, it's slick to them, and they just fall off. And it worked in the tub, but one day I was cleaning the tub, and I, I was taking plants out and shaking the plants, the plastic plants, taking other stuff, and I had a cart behind me, and, I, and this is when my wife, did do daycare down <laughs> She didn't find out about this. So, <laughs> she will now. Yeah. Hi, sweetheart. So I took one of our live plants out, you know, the, the cup under the plant, and this was a big, big uh, bushy plant, and I um, put it on the, the cart, turned around to get something else, and came. So if you've ever seen a sinking ship and the, you know, the, the rats coming off the sinking ship, they were all over the place. I mean, they were running out of this plant like like there were a million of them coming up and falling on the floor. And I was crushing these these lobster roaches just as quick as I could. Got the plant back in. I, I killed all the roaches. I killed all the roaches. <laughs> <laughs> and at that same day, I collected all my dubias and I collected because the daycare was looking away from me to you away from mm -hmm. From the reptile room, I collected all the dubias, I collected all the, the uh, lobster roaches, put them in bags. It was the winter time, took them outside and, and let them freeze, unfortunately. But 
and I stopped keeping uh, roaches at that point. Now that was about 10 years ago and about um, a year ago, uh, about three years ago, I kind of got a little bit away from the hobby and the, about a year ago I got back in. The very first thing that I did was I went out and got a culture of uh, dubia roaches to start the whole process. It wasn't the dubia roaches, it was these lobster roaches which were the problem. But again, because my wife had the daycare, I could not allow anything, you know, to be seen in her room. So, so all the all the roaches were gone. So <laughs> Well, so, I don't know what you get home and she's I will. <laughs> <laughs> Did you keep the day deck girls in like a group or were they all in separate cages? No, I kept them. I like to keep, boy, this is a great question. I like to keep day geckos in pairs, a uh, male and a female. And if you've ever had day geckos, and it seems to be true with the standing eye or the giant day geckos, Metagorensis, um, they, they do very, very well in pairs. They don't do very well in trios. Uh, mm -hmm. What will happen in a trio of day geckos? We're kind of off topic, but but great question. In a trio, you'll have a male and a female, and the theme, the dominant female will actually take. It doesn't matter what tank, size of tank. It can be as big as a room, I think. The dominant female will take ownership of the tank and be very very territorial, and you'll never see the the male be aggressive to the third animal, the second female. But you'll start seeing the dominant female position herself and the other one will start being submissive and won't put herself in the same good areas as the other. If you have a light on it, the dominant female will always be at the light. And then you'll start seeing a little mark here there on the subdominant female and in a day, in a day, that dominant female will just destroy the, the other female. I've, I've seen it probably three or four times. And, so I just talked about failures. I just stopped doing that. So if I'm getting day geckos, especially the, the giant day geckos or the standing out, I'll only get a pair. Um, I'll never ever try to get three in, a, in the same breed or a bigger group than a pair. Have you seen the same thing or you just kind of think? Yeah. Yeah, because you were talking about having, like if you were to talk about a group of them, like I was wondering if you had them all in separate cages or, or what? All of, yeah, all of my day, the only, all of my day geckos, I'll say, are in pairs, other than that one that was singular. Um, I know uh, Clumeri, I don't know if anybody, the neon blue Clumeri, which are just teeny tiny, and when you watch them, if you go on YouTube and look up Thalsuma uh, Clumeri or neon blue day gecko, um, in a big tank, they'll act like hummingbirds. They'll come up and they'll sit, and then they'll run over here, and another one, and they'll interact, and then they're off, and then they'll all come together again. They're just like little tiny hummingbirds. It's the coolest thing, and they're just absolutely gorgeous. So, I've seen clumeri in groups. I don't know if you know people successfully. You know, all the clumeri I've, I've ever had have been in pairs too. Mm -hmm. Concerns? Thoughts? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.